Welcome, everyone. I am Dory Clark here with Newsweek for our weekly interview show, Better. I am so pleased that today we have the opportunity to be speaking with Stephen Kotler, author of the new book, The Art of Impossible. Stephen, so glad to have you here. Dory, it's fun to be with you. Thank you so much. So Stephen, the first question that I have for you, you have in, in some ways developed a really clear brand around these issues. The books that you've written in the past, which I have read and enjoyed, you did Bold and Abundance with Peter Diamandis, you have The Rise of Superman, there's uh, an endless list, and it really seems to be focused pretty crisply on, uh, I'm gonna borrow a phrase from your own website here, which is uh, stephencotler.com, exploring the frontiers of human possibility. Now, a lot of people these days are looking at the world around them saying, uh, actually, <laughs> things seem right. like they're going downhill. W why do you take the opposite view? I came, I fell into journalism in the early 1990s and I was interested in neuroscience and psychology, how do people work? And I was interested in action sports. And the early 1990s in action sports were this great era of impossible. I saw more impossible feats, things that were never supposed to be done in history ever, not just get done, they were being iterated upon. And this was happening in every one of the sports, which was itself an amazing phenomenon. But if you knew action and better sport athletes, especially back in the 1990s, this was like a rowdy, irreverent bunch of people who had very little education, they had very little money, they had uh, they had horrific childhoods as a general rule, like broken homes, really tough childhoods. Um, there was a lot of risk taking. There was a lot of drug and alcohol abuse. And normally, you put those things together in a community. What you don't get is the reinvention of what's possible for the species. You get jail or death, right? Like that's what happens. And um, I'd seen similar things like this before in other communities. Um, but it really caught my attention because it was it's when people are doing things that were not supposed to ever happen in history on a routine basis. And it was these people, you're like, OK, one, um, something's wrong with our definition of impossible Two, maybe this stuff is easier for everybody. Right. Maybe there, there's I, I was very interested in the idea that there might be a formula. Of, of some kind that, you know, united all these athletes from different sports. And I took this question of what does it take to do the impossible into every domain imaginable. I took it into sports, of course, but science and technology and business and art and culture. Um, and, you know, wrote books about what I discovered. So Abundance, which seems to be about a book about technology, it's actually a book about people taking on impossible global challenges, hunger, energy scarcity, poverty, stuff that 10, 20 years ago was the sole province of like a big corporation and government. So the human beings are pulling this stuff off. And I wanted to know why. That's fantastic, Stephen. Thank you so much. And uh, certainly, Bold and Abundance uh, have have both been very useful books to me. In fact, uh, I'll I'll be sure to send you a copy. But I uh, I quote you in my new forthcoming book. So oh, awesome! Thank you. Yeah, really, really, nice. really appreciate the wisdom that you guys have shared. And I just want to say hello to all the great folks who are tuning in live. I see uh, questions and comments already. Nina has a great question. We'll go to Carlos is here from Colombia. Maria is here from New Jersey. Please, everybody, type into the chat box. Let us know who you are and where you are calling in from because we'd love to say hello to you. Uh, and welcome you to the conversation. But first, uh, Stephen, let's actually turn to Nina's question, which I think is probably on a lot of people's minds. The Art of Impossible, at, at its core, uh, is it's a it's a playbook about helping people achieve peak performance. Nina wants to know what have you got for us here? She says, Yeah, so Nina, it's a, it's a, right. We're in the pandemic. I yeah. want to perform my best. Holy crap! What do I do? So um, I, I'm going to try to answer this as quickly as possible because it's a, sort of a long answer. And the, the book has this in much more detail. But positive psychology has sort of spent a really long time, the past 30 years, looking at sort of not really peak performance, but sort of what does it take to get yourself ready to perform at your peak, right? There's, I call them, there's six things that are the positive psychology basics. And these are sort of like, this is the gate, a gateway, a gateway drug, just to get yourself ready to sort of do this work. But the ones you're looking for, there's three of the things that you need to do are on the physical side, like to create enough energy. So you need to get enough sleep at night. You need good hydration, good nutrition, and good social support, actually. Good support network around you really impacts our energy level. But on the mental side of the equation, anxiety blocks peak performance for a ton of different reasons. A little bit is great because it focuses attention. Anything above that, you're screwed. 
what are the three best tried and true ways of lower anxiety? And there's a bunch of signs underneath this, but a daily gratitude practice, which is either list three things you're grateful for and turn one into a paragraph. And the point is really feel the gratitude or I list 10 things I'm grateful for. And I write each one down by hand three times and sort of really try to feel the gratitude. Um, the second thing is 11 to 20 minutes of mindfulness, a respiration practice, a focused meditation practice, um, absolutely calms down the nervous system, or about 20 to 40 minutes of exercise. And here, you're not exercising for physical reasons, though, bonus, you'll get that, but you're going for mental health, right? So what you're looking for is the point that it gets quiet upstairs and your lungs expand. Those are signals that your body has released a chemical called nitric oxide, and it flushes stress hormones out of your system. So five minutes of gratitude, 11 to 20 minutes of mindfulness or 20 to 40 minutes of exercise. You know, normally I tell people, Hey, one a day, right? You don't have to go crazy on this. You pick one, do it once a day during times when we're running hot during times when there's a crisis going on, I go two a day. So since the start of COVID gratitude practice plus exercise every day, no matter what. And then I've been doing mindfulness stuff about three times a week. Um, uh, differently but i and i really i hate meditating um it's my least it's my least favorite of the of, of the tools and techniques i've meditated for 25 years so it's not that i don't do it it's just, i still don't like it i feel you thank you for that advice Stephen. that's that's fantastic and i just want to say hi to the great folks who are tuning in we've got darren from nashville Zhao Yu and her friend tham from toronto uh tim from calgary marianne's here in savannah borut from slovenia lena from from copenhagen we have christina from the nation of georgia dietrich from belgium Jeannie from oregon kathleen from uh from i wow there's too many people i'm like even losing track diane from cleveland we have johanna from bogota Mercedes from Miami. We're so happy to have all of you guys here. Please feel free to type your questions for Stephen into the chat box because we want to hear what's on your mind. And Stephen, something that I am curious about, in addition to the great books that you write, uh, and you are a very prolific author, you are the executive director of something called the Flow Research Collective. Can you tell us a little bit more? What, what is that and what yeah, does it sure. do? Great question. So first out, first off, shout out to Cleveland. Go Browns. Okay, now that that's over, um, I uh, whenever the impossible becomes possible, you see a bunch of different things, but one thing that is always present is essentially the state of consciousness known to researchers flow. You may talk about flow as being in the zone or runner's high. If you play basketball, it's being unconscious. Stand-up comics will sometimes call it the forever box. The lingo is endless. Um, there's whole like dictionaries of action sport terms for this stuff as well. Um, flow is, it's a scientific term. It's technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. More specifically, it's any of those moments of rapt attention and total absorption. We get so focused on the task at hand, everything else just seems to disappear. Action and awareness are going to start to merge. Your sense of self, self-consciousness, that's going to diminish. We'll get quiet upstairs. Time is going to pass strangely. Usually it speeds up and five hours go by in like five minutes, right? You're so engrossed and you just lost track of time. And throughout all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. So flow is essentially how evolution shaped human beings to perform at their best. Flow is universal. This is one of the most well-established facts in flow science. And flow science is very old, in fact, like 1870. So there's a lot of work that's been done. Um, and we know flow is universal. It shows up in anyone, anywhere, provided certain initial conditions are met. So everybody listening to this can get into flow. So when I say, you know, things like, human beings are capable of much more than they know. That's something I learned on 30 years of peak performance. One of the reasons is because we are all capable of tapping into flow. And what we, what we do with the Flow Research Collective is we study primarily focused on flow, but in general, the neurobiology of peak human performance. So what's going on in the brain and the body when we're performing at our best, we're always seeing flow as part of the equation. We're seeing other things. We're a research organization where we work with scientists at UCLA and Stanford, Imperial College, London, places like that. Um, and we're also a training organization. We take the science, we take what we're learning, we use it to train everybody from kind of members of the US Special Forces and professional athletes to kind of CEOs of Fortune 100 companies, all the way to like insurance brokers from Indiana and, you know, soccer moms from Iowa, everybody, we train everybody. And because of the work we're doing is sort of based on biology, Right, we're taking things back down to the kind of foundation of neurobiology that's shared by everybody. Our trainings tend to work for everybody. 
Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that, Stephen. And I see some new friends have tuned in. We have Siri Amrit from Vancouver. We've got Mohsin from Morocco, Alexandra from Bulgaria, Jessica from Boston, Skip from Kansas. We love having all of you guys. And please feel free to ask your questions for Stephen into the chat box. Stephen, one thing that I was struck by in reading The Art of Impossible, you had a, a chapter or a section in there, which uh, as, as a fellow author, I appreciated. It was called The ROI on Reading. And about uh, you were making an impassioned case about why reading a book is actually better ROI than reading uh, a web article or something that, that might seem easier for folks to do. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, it um, it's really foundational. So learning is key to peak performance and lifelong learning and learning is a catch-all for a bunch of sub skills right so there's skills acquisition there's knowledge acquisition but one of the sub skills is what should i learn from like what's the best source material and having that solved in advance sort of it it allows you to stay focused and solve some problems that way but i people you know as an author i you know i know i knew as a, you know i've worked as a journalist i've worked as a speaker i've presented information every way you possibly can and i it just started when people stopped reading books and i would hear oh i'm reading blogs i'm reading magazines and articles i would think to myself oh my god you have no idea what you're like robbing yourself of and so i wrote the roi i'm reading and the way i explain it is i'm going to write a blog i will and i care about my blog so i'll take about a day to kind of do some research you get four or five hours of research, maybe a couple of phone conversations, maybe. And uh, and then I'm gonna spend one time, I'm gonna do a writing session and then I'll clean it up the next day and probably publish it. So you're gonna get two to three days of my labor for about eight minutes of your time, right? Um, and that's the trade-off. You get, I, I give you three days, you give me eight minutes. I write a magazine article, say a story I would do for Wired or the Atlantic Monthly, 5,000, 6,000 words. Now, normal reading speed, you're going to take 20 minutes. Now you're giving me 20 minutes. Well, what do you get for a magazine article? Well, if I was writing for Wired, sometimes we would get up to a year of reporting. But let's just say, on average, you got a month of prep time before I pitch the story, three months of reporting on the story, probably another three months of editing time. And you would get my brain power plus my editors plus the editor in chief plus a fact checker, some other people would weigh in, right? So you give me 20 minutes and suddenly you're getting six, seven months. But a book, Rise of Superman, takes average person about six hours to read Rise of Superman. It took me 15 years to do the research and it's taking you six hours. You can, that's the most insane ROI in reading. Talks don't come close, podcasts don't come close. Books are the most information dense source of material on the planet and they're the best bang for your buck. Also even better, the brain loves specifics. It's a pattern matching machine. that will automatically find connections between new ideas you're learning and older ideas you have. This is intelligence, this is wisdom, this is all that stuff we're learning for. And the truth of the matter is, um, first of all, if you're just reading blogs and magazine articles, you're just learning the same shit as everybody else, right? One, so your competition knows the same thing. Um, two, it doesn't have enough density for the brain to work with it in any reasonable manner. So even if you think you're learning cool stuff, your brain's going to be able to do less with it because it's going to be less specific and the brain likes specifics. Yeah, really great point, Stephen. And a question came in from Buyan. He's actually a great member of my recognized expert course and community. And he wants to know, uh, you know, he, he's, he's bought into your idea that reading is great ROI. He says, my question is, what is the habit Stephen does on a regular or daily basis to ensure he's able to keep up on reading? Uh, do you have thoughts or tips about how you've integrated this into your own life, Stephen? I read 25 to 50 pages a day. I usually read... Uh, 30 pages of like neuroscience textbooks, um, which is about the point my brain starts to want to explode. Um, and then I will read uh, 30, 40 pages in something that's farther away from my discipline. I think it's very important um, to read at least 25 pages a day in a book that's far away from your core discipline for a couple of reasons. This has to do with creativity is another core skill we talk about. And 
one of the problems with creativity is, as I said, the brain is a natural pattern matching machine, right? When it, uh, what you're looking for is to connect ideas together. When ideas are really closely related, where all you're doing is reading in your discipline, it's, you you might be learning, but it's not really creating those big aha moments where things are getting linked together. When things get linked together in that way, you get a big squirt of dopamine. That helps cement in learning and things along those lines. So in the modern world, we tend to specialize. This is one of the reasons creativity tends to die over time because we specialize and there's not enough gap between the stuff we're learning and the older stuff we know to create kind of those big bursts of dopamine. And dopamine does a bunch of stuff in the brain, drives focus, it also enhances pattern recognition. So once we get it flowing in our system, that first connection is gonna lead to more connections and more connections and this is really gonna amplify learning. And it's easier to do that when you're reading outside your discipline. So 25 pages, 30 pages a day, inside my discipline, 25. And the second ones, I usually tend to read during an active recovery protocol at the end of my day. So I, I like to stack habits. I like things that fold, nestle into each other. Active recovery is a big part of peak performance. So that's saunas, Epsom salt baths, restorative yoga, that sort of stuff, long walks in the woods. I do a lot of Epsom salt baths, saunas, um, and I read in there so I can stack my practices together and save time. Love that. That's that's really useful. Thank you for that. And I'll just give a reminder to folks who are tuning in. If you're enjoying this conversation with Stephen, please hit the like button, please hit the share button so that your colleagues and friends can benefit from his insights as well. And if you'd like to make sure that you never miss a weekly conversation that we're having every Thursday, 12 Eastern, 9 Pacific uh, on the Newsweek LinkedIn channel, uh, just make sure to subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter. You can go to doryclark.com slash LinkedIn, hit the subscribe button, and you will get weekly reminders about our conversation with great thinkers. So I see, Stephen, that some questions have come in. Several people, uh, Nazira, Maria, and uh, Amit are all interested in a question. They want to know about audiobooks. Uh, can you get the same benefits? Is it just as good to be listening or do you need to be this, reading it physically? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. Um, the answer is we don't know. Uh, and the reason we don't know is there are some people who prefer audio learning to visual learning. Books is a form of visual learning, right? You're looking at the letters, looking at the words. What I tend to think personally is the problem with audio learning is you're keeping up with the narrator. So there's not space for you to come up with your own ideas, right? So you're never gonna be bouncing off what the narrator is saying into your own ideas because you're gonna lose your place. So. Some of it depends on what you read for, but I talked a second ago about how those aha moments of where your curiosity kind of really gets fired up. You learn something, it connects to something else, and you sort of get pulled out of the book for 50 seconds and think about this. That's what I read for. Those experiences are what I read for because the easiest way to learn a subject is to follow your curiosity through a subject, and those are the aha moments, right? That's my curiosity. In fact, those are the only things I actually tend to take notes on. Um, and I talk about this a lot in our impossible. So I'm not saying you can't get benefit from the audiobooks. Um, and if you're really, really audio prevalent, maybe you uh, maybe they work. I might try like pausing them as you're like at the end of a chapter just to think about stuff, to maybe artificially try to kindle those aha moments to reinforce memory. We don't know is the real answer and I, you know, and I, so I don't, I don't have good research. This is just one dude's opinion and I'm thinking out loud, but this is what I think. Makes, makes sense to me. Thank you. I think that's, that's really useful. And uh, I see actually, Stephen, that uh, an, a couple of folks, uh, Johanna and then uh, Siri Amrit also are curious about a similar topic. So I'll put this up on screen. If you, uh, if you're wanting to get into the flow state, are there particular things that you can do specific habits yeah, or a way great, to it's a great, turn it's it a on? great question. Yeah. So there's no three things you can do Monday morning. Like where did that, where that's nonsense. We're not going to have that conversation, but here's the answer. Um, it was remarkably trainable. So there are 
flow states have triggers. These are preconditions that lead to more flow. The easiest way to think about this scientifically is flow follows focus. It only shows up when a law of retention is in the right here, the right now, and the task at hand. That's what all these triggers do. They help drive attention into the present moment. They do it one of three different ways. They either drive dopamine or norepinephrine. These are focusing chemicals, performance enhancing chemicals, reward chemicals. Basically, when they're in our system, we pay more attention to the thing that's in front of us, or they lower cognitive load, which is all the crap you're thinking about at any one time. And if I lower cognitive load, I free up energy that tends to get repurposed for focus and attention. That's what the triggers do. 10 of them that will work for group flow. So a shared collective flow state. This is a great brainstorming session or a fourth quarter coming back in football to team performing as best. When there are 12 triggers that lead to individual flow. These are your toolkit. You want more flow in your life. These are the things you reach for. Um, I will also tell you, um, if you go to www.flowblocker.com, so there are also really standard things that stand between most people and more flow. And we just got sick of talking about it. We built the diagnostic. So there's six major things that tend to stand between people and more flow. Built the diagnostic, take the diagnostic at flowblocker.com. It will help you analyze what's standing between you and more flow. And it, it's filled with action steps that you can take to get rid of it. So the flow triggers are your toolkit. The Art of Impossible is a new book. It is the best place I can think of. It's the only place I can think of where, where that information of how to really utilize the flow triggers uh, is laid down. But I will tell you, uh, just so you have an understanding of this, um, we've gotten very good at this. The field, not me, me, Stephen Cutler, the field has gotten better at training flow using the neuroscience. Training from psychology was very, very difficult. The hit rate was lousy. So people tried to train flow from the psychology back in the 90s, early thousands, and it didn't work super well. We, uh, you, working with the neurobiology, we test everybody um, using the same basic psychometric instruments the psychologists use pre and post training. And we see on average about a 70% boost in flow. That's within eight week uh, training. Um, and so this stuff is really trainable. That's really interesting. It's, it's great to know that flow, there are the tools things we we're do. reaching for. There's just stuff we can do. Yeah, fantastic, Stephen. Thank you so much. And uh, I see great questions and comments coming in. If you're tuning in late, please feel free to type into the chat box. Let us know where you're coming from. Say hi to us. In the meantime, Stephen, I wanted to ask about something that you mentioned in the book. You speak about the importance of cultivating what you call gap-driven hunches. What does that mean? And why is that uh, an important thing to do? Interesting. So this is again in the section on knowledge learning, right? And it's um, it's about developing expertise in about about a subject and how to start getting comfortable with the like. How do you know you've got any level of expertise, right? Like as you're trying to kind of move up and different from physical skills is different if you're trying to learn a language or stuff like that. But if you're trying to learn neuroscience, or you're trying to you know something like that. One of the things that you, you get to a certain point where you start to realize that there are edges to the to the knowledge base, right? Like, oh, wow, neuro, like, right, if you're talking about neuroscience right now, on one end of neuroscience, the upper end, where things come off the rails and we go, okay, we don't know any more than this is sort of, we're starting to understand network level interactions in the brain and how networks drive behavior. And I start to, but that's sort of the upper edge and the lower edge is sort of at the molecular level. We know, for example, that there are epigenetic phenomenon that can cause neurochemical receptor sites, receptors to grow or die off, which changes a lot about how you'll behave. But that's sort of the edge of our knowledge. We don't quite like really know what they mean yet or how it works. Yeah, we're just like, so you're going to find those things as you're learning a subject, you're going to start to go, oh, wow, here's the edge. And I've got really weird questions about what's past that edge. And it seems like it's starting to bump, bump into other disciplines, right? Those questions are really what, that's a sign that, oh, wow, I'm learning the material. I know where the boundaries lines are. I'm not saying like that there's not good information beyond those boundary lines, but if you're gonna go beyond the boundary lines, first of all, you wanna know they exist, right? You wanna know this is sort of the edge of the crazy. And once you step beyond, people, respected people are gonna start to think, you you're this is into the realm of the crazy i'm not saying don't go there i'm saying understand why you're going there and where it is and that it exists and have, have think about it but in those 
spots between domains, just like in business, right? If you get between two markets, two markets come together in an unusual way, you often have a great idea for a new company. The same thing tends to be with any expertise. Once you're starting to get to the, once the questions are emerging that are like from between these disciplines, you can start to have a little more confidence that you're really starting to understand the subject. Really interesting, Stephen. Thank you so much. And uh, we're beginning to wind down. So last call, folks, for questions for Stephen, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, we are, of course, speaking with Stephen Kotler. He is the author of the new book. No, not that. The Art of Impossible. That is uh, Stephen's great new book. Stephen, something that, that you mentioned both in The Rise of Superman and your new book, The Art of Impossible, which I think is interesting. When many people think about learning, uh, the you know sort of the popular thing that comes to mind is, oh, 10,000 hours like Malcolm Gladwell talked about with Anders Ericsson's research. You write about how that is that is really not the be all and the end all when it comes to uh, to the art of impossible and peak performance. That there's actually some other things we need to keep in mind. Can you explain that a bit more? Yeah, it's um. So there've been sort of three major challenges to the ten thousand hour idea. Let's also be clear: you're gonna need expertise, right? You're not like it, and and and. You're, there's no way to avoid the hard work of doing the hard work. Like it's not, for, so forget about that. But there have been three major challenges to Anders Ericsson's ideas. Um, the first actually came from Ericsson himself, who said, look, Malcolm was asking a question. And when he summarized the research, he came up with 10,000 hours, right? For this is the amount of time it takes to get to expertise in a violinist. He said, honestly, that had more to do with the violinist and where Malcolm drew the line, right? Most violinists don't start kind of performing regularly for orchestras, for example, until they get to 20,000 hours, right? And they're age 30. Malcolm just picked this cutoff, this semi-arbitrary cutoff. And Andrew's point is, look, it really depends on the skill. You can become a memory expert in four or 500 hours. It's a very fast learning skill. Certain skills take forever. So that was sort of challenge A. And that's, you know, always the hazard when, and I, you know, I I'm, can be guilty of it too. When you're trying to popularize a concept and communicate difficult concepts, which Malcolm was trying to do, he did it very effectively. It is, you know, did some interesting work but he had to shorten some things down and that's sort of what got lost in the translation. Um, the second big challenge comes from um, my friend, David Epstein, uh, who's also friends with Malcolm, by the way. Uh, and this is uh, really written about in David's book, Range. And so 10,000 hours has led to this cult of early specialization, right? That the way to get great at something is to specialize early and just do 10,000 hours there. And it turns out that's not true at all. In fact, most experts have what is what economists call a uh, mat up. Uh, they, they have a long search period for match fit. This is a blend between your passion, your purpose, your strengths, your interests, blah, blah, blah. And it's only after this long sampling period where you test out this and you test out this and you test out this, do you settle on something? And then you tend to massively accelerate. Third challenge was flow. And it was exactly what we were seeing with the action adventure sport athletes back in the nineties. They were getting to mastery faster than they should. And it's because flow significantly amplifies learning. So this is experiments run by the US Department of Defense that show that soldiers in flow will learn about 240% faster than normal. They redid that experiment a different way and found that they could sort of train novices. Put By putting novices into flow, you could train them up to the expert level in about 50% less time. Now, these were marksmanship, archery, those are a specific kind of skill. So is this a blanket statement? Does it work everywhere? Probably not. But the point is that flow massively amplifies learning for a bunch of neurobiological reasons that we understand very well. And the more time you spend in flow, the sh shorter the path to mastery will be. But because flow is so much damn fun, you're going to like the experience so much. You're going to end up spending 20,000, 30,000 hours doing the thing anyways, just because it's producing that much flow. It does. It's not, I mean, you'll shortcut the path to mastery, but you're going to be so addicted to the experience that you're going to end up putting in those hours anyways. That it may be a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. 
Such an important point, Stephen. That's fantastic. So we have time perhaps for just one more question under the wire. I will encourage you all, check out Stephen's book, The Art of Impossible. You can learn more about him at stephencotler.com and you can make sure you never miss a weekly Newsweek set interview session. Go to my website, doryclark.com. You can sign up for a free download there and be added to the list. So I can't resist, uh, Stephen. I'm just curious about uh, your thought. Of course, your, your collaborator, Peter, Peter Diamandis, is very involved in this. But uh, our friend here, uh, Dr. Terry Mulligan, says, uh, "What are your thoughts about the singularity? You know, small, small concept here. Uh, but what, you know, if we have so, like one or two, yeah, things all right. So, uh, Terrence, um, I don't like you, man. Um, so, Ray's idea of the singularity is we're going to get to a point where uh, we can't predict what comes next, right? The technology is advancing so quickly, we can't." predict what comes next and maybe like maybe that happens maybe it happens Ray's predictions have been remarkable in terms of their timetable um i don't honestly i don't think a lot about it i think there's a bunch of other singularities that are coming a lot quicker that are much more interesting or troublesome or or, or whatever and um i'm not convinced that there's a time horizon that we don't we don't get to see beyond. I'm convinced that there's a time horizon we can't see beyond from where we presently are, right? And I'm not like, I'm not trying to disagree with Ray. He's freaking brilliant. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the smartest guys on the planet without a doubt, but um, Ray's predictions are also based on like consciousness and strong AI and certain, certain ideas around um, how AI becomes conscious that I don't agree with, that, are, that they, they're different the neuroscience doesn't, I think the neuroscience works different than Ray thinks the neuroscience works, I think. And we haven't, there, there's a debate here. And I, if I were you, I would bet on Ray more than I bet on me um, in this particular topic. Uh, maybe with human performance, you might want to bet on me a little bit more. But like when it comes to this stuff, I bet on Ray. But I, we do have a difference of opinion on this, um, though not on very much else. Fantastic. The book is The Art of Impossible. You can get it from Stephen Kotler. He's at stephenkotler.com. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us here for Newsweek. Dory, thank you. Thank you for your interest in my work. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.